John, come and open God's word to us. Uh, let me pray with you, brother. Father, thank you so much for my dear brother and friend, John, who um, is such an inspiration to, to so many people. And Lord, now as he turns his attention to, to your word and as we turn our ears to what John has to say to us, Lord, I pray for your anointing to fall afresh upon him and upon all of us in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you, brother. Great to see you all. Um, we're back. To Acts, and uh, we're looking at Acts 17 this week, so, um, or Acts 16, sorry, I'm getting out of my head. So, um, we had, we had a great respite. Everything okay? No, turn it on. Turn it on. Um, <laughs> there we go. Can you hear me now? Oh. Oh, dear me. Great to see you all. Um, so we're going to look at Acts 16 this week, and um, it's, it's around Paul's second missionary journey. So um, it's quite interesting because um, reading around the background to it, the first missionary journey was some five years ahead of this, um, the commentators think. So this is five years later after his first missionary journey. Um, and if you, if you go back to before Easter, David was sharing with us from Acts 15 around there was this controversy about the fact that there were Gentile converts. The Holy Spirit was breaking out amongst Gentile believers. And uh, they were concerned about what they should do in terms of what teaching they should provide, what, what, what were they required to do under the law. And do you remember that David took us through the letter that was written by the council in Jerusalem. And Paul, uh, together with Silas, and shortly we'll see he, he, he gets together with Timothy, start taking this letter out to the various churches uh, where they are to, um, to bless the churches. So that's the context. And um, we're going to... What I thought I would do is we're going to dive in. I felt the Lord sort of uh, show me a couple of areas that he really wanted to dive into this week. But what I thought I'd do is... There's a load happening in Acts 16. So I thought what we would do is, is, is run through a little bit of a commentary about what goes on to give you a little bit of a flavour of all the things, all the activities that they get up to in this, um, in this second missionary journey. It's a bit like race around the world, for those of you that are following that at the moment on television. Um, so, first of all, Paul meets Timothy um, in Lystra. Timothy was born to a Jewish mother. He had a Greek father. Um, he joins Paul and Silas together. Paul then gets Timothy circumcised. They start in the cities of Lystra and Derb, and they deliver this message of the council's letters to the churches. Uh, they then plan to set off, and uh, the Holy Spirit then forbade them from going to Asia. They were going to head to southwest Turkey, to Asia Minor, but the Holy Spirit, it reads in the, in the text, actually said, no, no, you're not going there. They then thought, well, we're going to head north to uh, a place called Bith Bithine Bith 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 Bithynia. I think I've got it. Bithynia. Um, but again, the Holy Spirit said, no, 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 you're not going there. You're not going to the north. So they then came to a town called Troas. And in Troas, Paul is given a vision. Um, and he meets this man of Macedonia, which we're going to dig into in a bit. And the man from Macedonia pleads to Paul to say, come over to Macedonia to help us. So immediately they set off. They sailed over the Aegean Sea uh, from the continent of Asia to the continent of Europe. The first time the gospel has been taken into Europe. They sailed some 156 miles in just two days. Uh, we, le we learned from the commentary elsewhere that actually in previous attempts it's taken them five days. So the Holy Spirit's really with them. They've got a following wind. They get there in a couple of days. They land at a place called ne Neapolis. And then they go to the regional city, which is a place called Philippi, um, which is the sort of more foremost city in Macedonia. The city has no synagogue. And um, so the team went to the riverside, where it was a traditional place for people to meet to pray. And, um, and they, they met a, a group of women, amongst of whom was Lydia. And she was a seller of purple cloth, and uh, she was visiting Philippi, I'd imagine, with her business. And um, 
She was originally from a town called Thy Thyatira. Oh, I said, I'm not very good at these, am I? Thyatira. And um, she had her heart open to the Lord and gave her life to Christ. And we find out that she got baptized and her whole household got baptized. Then she begged Paul and Silas and Timothy to come back to her house uh, to meet with her family and stay. In that town, they met a slave girl. And the slave girl was demon-possessed. She was a fortune teller. She followed Paul and Silas and Timothy around. And uh, she was owned by um, a couple. And that couple made a, a great deal of fortune out of this slave girl's um, supernatural powers. Paul got so fed up with the girl following them around and declaring all of the time that these men are men of God that have brought the word of salvation that he actually at one point said, okay, enough's enough, I'm going to deal with this. He turned around and he actually cast out the demon from the slave girl. It caused an uproar in the town because the slave girl was making a, a big amount of money for this particular couple. And then the couple turned around and realized that this money was no longer going to be theirs because the girl had been healed from the demon that possessed her. They created a disturbance and said these people in the city are causing havoc. They got the magistrate to intervene and they got put, Paul and Silas, not Timothy, got put into jail. Um, they were chained in a maximum security jail because they were not only jailed, but they were also chained hand and foot to the floor of the jail. What were their response? To praise God. They praised God. For the, even in their situation, they praised the Lord, knowing that they'd had the calling from the Macedonian man. What happens next? An earthquake appeared. So God used a natural situation supernaturally. So an earthquake came in a mighty move. It shook the jail. It, it rocked open the doors. It loosened the chains. The prison guard thought life was coming to an end because he saw all the prisoners could escape. He took a sword and was about to drive it through himself when Paul and Silas shouted out, having not moved from their prison cell, and said to them, hey, we're still here, don't worry. The prison guard, trembling, came and kneeled at their feet and said, what do I need to be saved? How do I get salvation? The guard then became, moved from being the master to becoming the servant. He took them home, Paul and Silas. He tended to their stripes, to their injuries, because they were flogged and beaten before they were taken to jail. Him and all of his household came to Christ. <laughs> Praise God. Paul and Silas thought, well, we don't want to get this guy into trouble, the guard, because if we realize that we've all escaped from the jail, the guard's going to get thrown into jail himself. Or even worse, he might get, um, he might get a worse sentence by actually being um, condemned to death himself. So they went back into the jail voluntarily. Um, they then revealed to the, to the local people, that actually, hey, we're Roman citizens. The magistrates were terrified, realizing that they'd flogged and beaten and imprisoned Roman citizens. They weren't just Jewish uh, people from, from away. They were actually citizens of the Roman Empire. They begged them for forgiveness, set them free. But Paul, being Paul, didn't want to leave um, with his tail between his legs. He left as he wanted to leave by first going um, to Lydia's house where they created a house church and he blessed all the believers before he left to then to go on his journey to Thessalonica. Amazing. So that's what Acts 16 is all about. And when I looked at it, I thought, Lord, what are we, we going to go into here? We could spend the next several Sundays looking at all of the things that the Lord could show us through this amazing thing. We've just got an exciting missionary journey starting in Ledbury. How is the Lord going to intervene? How is the Lord going to direct our path? How is he going to call us to the work that he's got for us here as Kiln Church? So I felt there were two things that the Lord had put on my heart that we should share. One was around the comparison of the two conversions between Lydia and the prison guard. Just quickly, I wanted to read um, about Lydia's conversion. So I'll just read 16, 11 to 15. 
So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Simatharas, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened up her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And afterwards she was baptized, and her household as well. She urged us, saying, If you had judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. It was interesting that there was no synagogue in, in the town where they met Lydia. Um, reading, reading around this, in, in Jewish law, it took a quorum of ten Jewish men to make a synagogue. So irrespective of how many women, Jewish women there might be, if there wasn't the tenth man, if there was only nine, there wouldn't be a synagogue. How amazing that the Lord led them to a group of women. How amazing that the first person converted in Europe that was taking the gospel to the whole of the Western nations, as we know it now, was a woman. <laughs> How incredible that God used this woman, Lydia, a businesswoman. <clears throat> Lydia was a seller of purple, and um, exciting, because um, purple was dealt with great value. It was a luxurious product. Perhaps today she might have been a, uh, a salesperson for Christian Dior or something. It was a, a really upmarket product. The dyes for making purple were expensive and highly regarded. Um, she was from the city of uh, Thyatira. And Thyatira was well known as the center for this purple dye and fabric. Later, this church that was planted in her hometown was one of the seven churches address, addressed in Revelation um, when Jesus went through the seven churches. Um, and we read in verse 14 that the Lord opened her heart as Paul was speaking to her. And um, I, I just think that's such a precious word. The Lord's really implanted that on, on me this week as, we, as I've been praying around this. The Lord gently opened her heart. It says in John 6.44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And um, for those of us that are praying for family members, for friends, for neighbours, for work colleagues, it's, um, it's so, so important to pray about that warmth and openness, that tenderness of heart, that the Lord would open up people's hearts to be receptive to the Holy Spirit. And I think that's a, a really, really valuable word for some of us. And I've been praying that as I've been thinking and pondering on this word this week. As I've been praying in the morning for people, I've been saying, Lord, please open up their hearts. Please make it a tender place, a good soil where that seed can be planted. They'll be so receptive to what the Holy Spirit has got for them. So let's contrast quickly Lydia's conversion, a successful and respected businesswoman, to this, what we could imagine, a fairly rough occupation being the local prison guard. See, Lydia, we can see, well, she was a churchgoer. She was a God-fearing woman. We can pretty much presume that the guard was not. Lydia, when she met Jesus, she was a respected businesswoman. The guard, when he met Jesus, was about to kill himself. Lydia's heart was gently opened. The guard's heart was violently confronted. The guard had a remarkable earthquake, a, a remarkable impact, a, an earthquake. The Lord delivered an earthquake. 
to save that guard. Lydia had the gentle move of the Holy Spirit. But both heard the gospel and both believed. And through each of them, their families and their households came to Christ. What a strange and wonderful church God planted. We look around us and I said to David, you know, we're a pretty weak and feeble bunch, kiln. But praise God for that. Praise God that he didn't deliver us, you know, all, all, of, all of the best that Herefordshire, Gloucestershire and Worcestershire can bring to Ledbury. We won't be able to look back at Kiln and say, Lord, you, you know, we did this, we did this. No, it's all about the Lord. It's all about the Lord. And what a church he left. He left, he left Lydia and, and her family. He left the rough uh, prison guard and his family. He perhaps left the slave girl. Just imagine that first church, the first church in Europe that he planted. I just felt um, in my spirit it, that tenderness of heart. I just think it would be good for a moment if, to just quickly pray uh, that believer's prayer. If there's anyone here, uh, I think m many of us have asked Jesus into our hearts, but if there's anyone here that hasn't asked Jesus into their hearts or feels that they've really gone cool with the Lord, I just, let's just pray for a moment. Lord Jesus, I, I just ask, Father, that you would um, open up tender hearts. And if, if that's you this afternoon, as I pray, just pray this prayer as I say it in, quietly for your own heart. Father, I'm so sorry for the things that I've done, for the times that I felt a long distance from you. But Jesus, today, I just ask that you would come into my heart. That you would feast with me and me with you. Thank you, Jesus, that you would wash all the dirt away and give me a fresh heart. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, Lydia and the prison guard's conversion. The second thing I felt that the Lord wanted to share is the Macedonian call. And um, I just want to quickly read that as well, if you've got it in your Bibles. Um, so it's from verse 6 to 10. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. <clears throat> Paul's plan was to go and strengthen the churches that he'd visited in his first missionary journey, that he planted in the Asian province. His plan, his man-made plan, was to go to southwest Turkey. The Lord shut the door on him. And that's perhaps a word for some of us today. You know, we get doors shut on us. But not only once on this journey, but twice, because then Paul thought, even as close as he was to the Lord, he thought, well, I'm going to head north and we'll go to Bithynia. But no, the Lord said, no, 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 you're not going to Bithynia. The end, he ended up then somehow directing along the sort of southern coast of the Black Sea. And he skirted through the region of Mysia. 
and he eventually came to the seaport of Troas. So he'd been redirected twice. Paul was pretty much at a standstill on the eastern coast of the Aegean Sea. And there he received this Macedonian call. And it happened during the night when the Lord visited him and showed him a man from Macedonia calling out to him in a vision to say, please come at once because we need you. We need your help. It's really interesting that actually um, an interesting change of perspective occurs between Acts 16.8 and Acts 16.10 because it moves from the third person to the first person in the narrative. And um, it's just really interesting. God, I think, there's a couple of, some of the commentators think Luke arrived in Troas because Luke was the author of Acts. And Luke arrived in Troas and actually went with the missionary journey across the Aegean Sea and actually went with Paul. Uh, that's what a lot of the scholars believe. But I, but I also think, isn't it remarkable how personal it was? You know, that first person, um, God calling out to, to Paul the importance of going to Macedonia. Paul obeyed the vision. If the Macedonians needed help, then he would go to Macedonia. And it resulted in him sailing from Tras, as we talked about, going directly to Neapolis in two days, and then moving on to Philippi, where we've just read about these incredible events with Lydia, with the slave girl, and then with the prison, the prison escape. But Paul planted Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth, these churches were all absolutely central to the growth of the gospel in the early church. Five of the New Testament epistles came from this work, from this obedience to this call. Church history itself was transformed through his obedience to this call. Things were forever changed because the doors were closed and then he was obedient to this call. And um, one thing I wanted to just, just share that I felt was on my heart, and uh, a few of us have been feeling a little bit challenged in this area at the moment, which is, do we believe in a theology that contains believers doing the work of Jesus? It, it, it sounds so obvious, doesn't it? But do we believe in a theology about believers doing the works of Jesus. I've, I've been a Christian 35 years, and if I'm honest, you can look respectable, you can go with the flow, you can turn up on a Sunday, you can say good prayers, you can even belong to a home group and look very, very, you know, encouraging and exciting. And by the end of the day, did I truly believe that I could do the work of Jesus? That's where I think the message is for us today. That's where God is taking kiln. That he's calling believers to believe that they can do the work of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're called to. This is not at all um, rehearsed. I don't know how this is going to go, but I, I've asked Richard to come and share. Um, and uh, because just like the call of the Macedonians, God's been moving amongst us, and um, it's exciting times for what's going on. And I, uh, I asked, I've asked Richard to come along and share what the Lord's been putting on his heart. <clears throat> it is on, yeah. Um, six, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, I um, stood up here and said received my first healing um, personally um, my shoulder was still fine it's just amazing um, and that was the 16th of March the 16th of March is a, a day I'll remember for the rest of my life for another reason as well um, and that was because I had this unbelievable dream 
in the middle of the night. And most of my dreams are sort of a bit weird and usually people are trying to kill me or I'm trying to run away or I'm falling off something. Something like that. It's all jumbled up as well. But, but this was something, I can remember it like it's just happened, like I can see you guys now. Uh, it was so, so vivid uh, and unexpected. And uh, uh, it's just completely blown my mind ever since, really. And it's really made me think about you know, when um, Peter gets up at Pentecost and starts quoting from Joel, uh, Joel 2. Um, and he talks about how God will put his spirit on all peoples in the last days. And sons and daughters will uh, prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will have dreams. Old dreams. <clears throat> but there we are. That's the bad bit. Um, but just to tell you a bit, bit about this dream, it's really to encourage you. And just what John said at the end, I just so think really fits with, uh, with this dream. So just, it's a bit weird, but just bear with me. So just out of the blue, suddenly I could see in, out of the darkness uh, this square-shaped city just with castellated walls in light um, and uh, the turrets at the corners and stuff like that. Um, but I couldn't see anything else, and I was kept from seeing everything else in that city somehow. I don't know why, but I was. But then I looked a bit more closely. It was a sort of bird's-eye view. And just... In one area of the city was a tiny little building uh, with a door, just a door and a pitch roof. It was just one room and uh, with light flooding out from the door. And then suddenly we, and this is the home group, but I'm absolutely certain it applies to absolutely everybody in this uh, room now and many other people as well. Um, but suddenly uh, we were all in this, in the home group, every single person I was stood in this room and we were all standing around a worktop which was made of wood um, and all around the ceiling was this, was this amazing decoration with jewels and gold and it was incredibly ornate um, a bit over the top perhaps but uh, it was absolutely astonishing, astonishingly beautiful and, um, and on the walls as well um, but much, much, much more beautiful. And this is the thing I will just so treasure for the rest of my earthly life, was this light. And it was just astonishing. I can still see it now, and I so wish you could see it as well, like I can see it now. Um, it was so, so vivid and so beautiful. So, so beautiful. Uh, it was just full of love and peace and joy and hope. It was so sort of clear and sharp, but soft at the same time. Um, I cannot tell you how, how beautiful that light was. We were invited, and there was no voice, but we were invited um, to reach down to, to, to one of the walls, sort of at skirting, at skirting board level, and there were these books. Um, just all lined up one by one and each book had the name of each person in the home group on them so one, one book for me, one book for John one book for Joe, etc, etc and they, these books were leather bound and very ornate and, and beautiful um, and we were invited to put them on the, the central island um, next to each other and uh, you could see how beautiful they were, but when, when we put them up onto the table, um, you could see in, the, in the, um, the light that was in that room, they were just so much more beautiful. And looking at these um, um, books, they were just covered in, in filigree, gold and silver and platinum and precious metals in amazing decorations and in, within that filigree work were these amazing um, gemstones which would put the crown jewels to shame. They were astonishing, huge, great things. And 
everybody, everybody, and this is a really important thing, everybody had gemstones on the cover of their book, their own individual book. And they were all different, but they were all beautiful, astonishingly beautiful. And when these gemstones shone in the light, they just made, they were just even more beautiful. But then the light started to move from the gemstones, from one person's book to another, and to another, and to another. And that was my um, dream. Now, when we were hearing about um, what Paul saw in Macedonia, not only did he um, interpret, have this dream, but he interpreted it correctly and then obeyed it uh, very, very, very quickly. It said immediately, didn't it, in the text? And um, I, I feel, I don't know, I'm no expert on these things, as, you, as I'm sure the no, those of you who know me uh, will know, but I feel that the interpretation is this, and that is that we all have gifts we all, every single person in this, um, this room has gifts. And the reason I say that was we were talking about um, a, um, a passage in Ephesians 4 where it says that Christ gives gifts to um, equip people for uh, the believers, all of us, for works of service, to build us up um, so that we become one in unity um, and it goes on and on. But, um, and, but um, uh, reaching maturity um, and I feel very strongly that the, the Lord was saying that these, these gemstones on the front of each one of our books are gifts of the spirit um, and we all have them perhaps sometimes though we don't operate them or we're frightened to operate them or we don't believe we operate them so I think the challenge for me anyway, and I haven't heard anything further about this from, from, from my own perspective, but the challenge for me and perhaps for all of us is to ask God, well, Lord, what gifts have you given me? Because 